Hi. Hi. I've come back to some of you who've been before. It's kind of nice to see familiar faces. I'm Kath Smythe. I'm the horticulturist with the Calgary Horticultural Society. And my special guest today, who tells me she I won't invite her back again, <laughs> is Joanna Tudy. And she is the Community Gardens Coordinator for the Society. Now, she, I've also known Joanna with many other hats, but she as far as I'm concerned, is one of those horticulturists that's really knowledgeable and really knows what she's talking about. So we're going to go... For the most part. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always learning. That's why I like to sit next to you, Kath. So, <laughs> she does. She whispers. <laughs> um, I usually ask my guests to bring their favorite gardening tools. So I thought we'd start off with that. But if you should have a question, please interrupt us. We're quite willing to answer and give advice where we probably aren't even invited, but we'll give advice. <laughs> <laughs> well, I left the tool shed at home. Oh, which good. <laughs> is actually looks more like just the back of my minivan because most of my tools travel with me. Um, I brought a few tools, so most used would be my bypass pruners. I love Falco brand. Um, they've just been with me my whole life and you can take them apart and clean them and use them and just, I would always jump at the landscape guys when they were trying to cut the metal strapping off the paver pallets. I'd be like, not a chance, don't do that. <laughs> but if they did, cause they inevitably would, you can always take them off and file the blade back down again and then never loan them to the, your landscape buds. This Ever is, again. This is my most used one this summer. So my taproot weeder. This is great for anything with a long root. And uh, on the drive, we were saying this is like uh, the summer of Canada thistle. So their roots are really long. Tap roots like a long, skinny, annoying carrot that won't <laughs> give up. So you can get that down next to the root and lift it like a dandelion. And it, the, the idea is that it pops the root right out or the majority of it, so you don't have to come back and get it. But my favorite tool, <laughs> you asked, <laughs> is this deer antler. Um, and it's just a little nubby one. <laughs> so- I warned y'all, I warned you. <laughs> I use this for seeding in the, sometimes for weeding, um, but mostly when I seed in the springtime, I need to make a track. I need to make a small trench for my seeds or I need to, dibble holes it's just perfect and it was just laying around um in the garage i don't know i must have picked it up during a hike and i thought oh i'll use that for something and then one day i couldn't find my trowel and i don't know i just grabbed it and since then it's been my favorite it's ergonomic it fits my hand really well if i lose it and it stays in the garden it can compost and that's fine it won't never rust and yeah, I don't know. I use it a lot in the spring. You'll time. never go hiking without looking for one. <laughs> <laughs> so to me, this um, is a nod to like traditional style seeding where often it just be a sharp digging stick. So, you know, our ancestors planted that way well before, you know, agronomy really took shape and we mechanized everything it was a sharp digging stick was probably a woman's number one tool <laughs> in a hunter-gatherer society so this makes me feel like I'm connected to uh, my ancestors and maybe what I plant has some good roots to it so that's why I brought that to yeah care. my mom always had a branch leaning in various parts of the garden <laughs> and to just do that yeah and if I need to tell my kids something I'll say I can point with it, like, bring me that thing over there, and then they, they don't mess with me, it seems like, when I have something in my hand, so. Well, I honestly, I use kitchen, kitchen utensils, and I think I've told this story a hundred times. My husband and I had only been married about a month, month and a half, and he invited his boss to dinner, and he was being the chef and cleaning up the kitchen and doing all of that, and he hollers from downstairs to upstairs and he says, I thought you said we got eight place settings of cutlery. And I'm upstairs trying to clean the dirt from the garden off me and I go running down the stairs and out to the garden shed because I had the soup spoons and two forks out there. <laughs> so for our wedding anniversary for the next 28 years, he gave me cheap soup spoons. 
<laughs> so I would leave the cutlery alone. So everything's neat. Nice. But I like spoons because, like Joanna, I like the top of it for digging small bedding plants in. But I use the handle just about as much. And when I'm looking for sp soup spoons in my stash, because trust me, he gave me so many that I still have a box full. <laughs> if I ever need any, I've got them. But I like this broader piece, and it is just literally for dibbing in. I'll do my seedling stuff from the house and I'll dib in with them. So, you know, you, you all develop our character and our thing that we do. So do you guys have a favorite tool? You ladies? <laughs> the, the bypass pruners? Yeah. I like the hori hori. The hori hori, yes. I, I know it's very, very popular and I, I think they're great. I really, really do. But mine went missing oh. two or three years ago. I'm quite certain it's buried in my garden with the missing phone. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Never. Two valuable things side by side. Oh, buried. they're probably buried. I have I had three cordless phones. I'm down to two. Uh-oh. Well, <laughs> too bad it's not with the charge. You could call it and find your hori hori. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Except that I think the battery died several months ago or years ago. Yeah, Because it's been missing for two years. I never give up hope. I kept the charger. <laughs> <laughs> so. awesome. Well, so at this time of year, there's several things going on in the garden. One of the things that I enjoy is picking flowers out of my garden. And I kind of do it as I'm going along and I'm deadheading. And I'm, I'm right now I'm dealing with the fact that my delphinium is going to seed. So I, I really want to get some of the seed and dry it. And I found a couple that were still in bloom. So I was quite thrilled to see this. This is one of my favorites. This is Astolat. And I like it because he has the black bee, which is what you call the center of the flower. And so I went around and picked some of that this morning. And the Liatris is just coming into its glory. This is native. This is a native flower. And the Liatris is lovely. The bees love it. So do the wasps. So do several other insects. But it's just starting to make that lovely, furry cascade of purple. So, I, I mean, I go around and then... My neighbor irritates me. Did I say that out loud? <laughs> <laughs> My neighbor is quite getting into garden. She's a lovely young woman. I quite enjoy her. But she doesn't deadhead her peonies. And she doesn't pick the flowers as they finish. So as a result, they're all the basal plates of the flowers after they've shed. And sometimes they pollinate in their seed heads, which I thought I'd grabbed one, but I guess I missed it. But so I try to go around and clean these up too. To me, half of our issue is cleaning up and doing that while we're cutting flowers and doing all of that. I was a little disappointed because I thought I had deadheaded my sweet peas. Instead, all the knee highs are flowering, but all the tall ones aren't but they smell wonderful. <laughs> so I just gathered a few off the branch. And this is my daylily, and this is another fave of mine. This, color. this is called Happy Returns, and it's one of the ones that flowers longer than one day. Because they're Stella Doro, the most popular yellow one, is selected because it flowers more than one day. Because the old, old fashions, literally, they would produce their flower and they're done. And then just to add a touch, this is my Morden blush, and it's a shrub rose, and it's a smaller one. It only gets about this tall. But the fragrance right now in my garden is what draws me out there. So I'll go out and visit and do that and see what I can pick. What are you picking in yours? I haven't really picked a whole bunch. Like you, my delphinium are fading, so they're they're turning. I actually think there's when they get pollinated their little seed heads look a lot like a miniature version of the peonies yes they, they do pollinated. yes so if you see a larger version of these sort of like three beans or sometimes four they look like beans that would be a pollinated peony flower head what? um my annabelle hydrangeas are in their third year of being planted second year second year uh -huh. and they are huge they're massive so it's just what i wanted that's why i planted that um shrub those white big white pom-pom flowers are so gorgeous um 
Let's see, my ornamental allium is just, it's like such a diehard. That flower just goes and goes and goes. No, no sign that it's fading at that all. That big purple flower is just, yeah. you know, yeah, I really think nice. I have a thing for purple. Yeah, well, I think I purple's might. Purple's easy in the prairies. <laughs> we have a huge selection of purple. Yes, for yes. Um, and I love my ornamental onion because I can save save seeds and propagate that really easily. And then that's a good one that I can give away to friends and stuff. It's great for the winter sowing. Um, really easy. Uh, my salvia that I cut back a while ago is repeat blooming, so that's cool to see. I always it's always a sort of a gamble when I hack it back and it's still got lots of bees coming to it but it's pretty faded um, so that's starting to go again my uh, what are they called Bella Lugosi daylilies so that's like a blood red with a yellow throat they are just going crazy right now and but they take me out in the garden more because then I ha I just can't handle when they fade and then there are these sort of gummy looking, you know, yeah. flowers. So I'll go out and snap off the old flowers. Um, yeah, my sedums are going nuts. So this is just this heat. The summer has been really good for the garden. Um, as long as you can keep the watering consistent. Yeah. yeah. So. <laughs> yes. May I ask a backup about the peonies? My neighbor has offered me fern leaf, and I am the opposite of a peony expert. I don't have any. Um, has offered some fern leaf. Oh, wow. So. Wow. One root is, root is worth about $85. I know, <laughs> in the garden center. Yes. But anyway, is this about the time? You want to wait about another three weeks. Three weeks. Okay. <clears throat> and when you do transplant them, mm -hmm. oh, I didn't leave any leaf. Where the leaf, where the root joins the stem is usually a very small envelope that sort of sticks out. Mm -hmm. Make sure that's not covered in soil and don't bury it any deeper than it was at your neighbor's house. In fact, I would tie a string to remind myself or something like that when I go to transplant it. I would do it probably in about three weeks. And the other thing is that if it stays dry the way it is, water the soil. Make sure the soil is wet, the hole is wet, and then plant it, and then make sure that you've staked it a little bit. And don't prune it to the ground. Leave it alone till next year. Okay. And that should get it going. I, I mean, a lot of people say to me, um, well, I put root starter in the fertilizer, or some form of fertilizer in there. I actually will go out in about a week after I plant it, and I'll use compost tea and I will water the root ball that way. Okay. <laughs> Although I was having a conversation. I don't know if any of you know John Ostroden from Greengate. He's the green goods buyer and their horticulturist, or was. And he, <laughs> he buys fish at the deli and cuts up pieces of it and puts it under his plants. He has one of the most spectacular large plant collections I've ever seen. But my, and then I got thinking about it and in my grandpa's garden diary, and I remember as a child riding the bus from downtown with him with fish in his shopping bag because he used to plant things and put the fish in there. <laughs> so, well, I, you know, grandpa had great success. We had monster trees. We had really some amazing stuff in his back garden. Any fish, as he, as they I don't say. Think you need a lot, though. No, you don't. My mom used to do that with her corn. Yes. So yeah. Throw in like uh, we use perch. Yes. So growing up on the Great Lakes, perch were just these tiny little. You just use them in a fish fry, so they just all go in the deep fryer. So there's little minnow type things. Yeah. She'd put them under each corn seed. She'd have a fish underneath. Yeah, and my mother did fish under hers as well and but she'd send us out in the lake it's freezing cold and she'd send us out there with the little fish nets to catch the minnows so i think you could also get by with like fish emulsion yeah yeah or kelp meal yeah if you don't really feel like and that sea soil fish. that sea soil has lots of the nutrients of the fish mm -hmm. but john still puts fish in it so <laughs> that's like when you find what works you sort of cling to it eh? yes that's one of those yes. tips that yeah, maybe that needs to make it into the book. Well, I really enjoyed the fact that I went, oh my goodness, your tomatoes, they were six feet tall. They are six feet tall. 
And he says, well, the secret, and then he gives me his usual <laughs> spiel about it. So there's everything that you can do when you're doing that. And we aren't at the end of the season, as far as I'm concerned, because you can transplant your peonies right now. The weather's cool enough. In the fall, it was always, always said, you plant either you plant your conifers in the spring or you plant them in the fall. The growers don't like to part with the bigger conifers right now to transplant. They want to wait for the fall and then they'll do all that transplanting. And that's when they want to do it. And then a lot of the bigger nurseries that bring spruce and any conifer in, their digging will be done September, end of September into October so that they can get a good root ball and then they'll pot and they'll bag them so that they're ready for next spring. So it's it's just, I don't think it's the end of the season. No, I don't I, think so, we, but you can feel a little coolness coming in, which is a nice break because we've had a unseasonably warm summer. And I'm tired of sleeping with my fan. <laughs> <laughs> so, Night times feel a little cooler when the sun yes, goes down. Yes, when the sun goes down, we are seeing that. Yeah. And that speaks, the other thing about growing things and growing in the ground is, the shorter day length triggers more root development than upper development. So that is something that you want to look for and do when you're doing it. But you've got, what is this? This what? is asparagus. So I probably should have planted this out, but while we're talking about transplanting, um, this is my, <laughs> I like to do winter sowing. So these went out, uh, I just put seeds in the pot and in just this much soil, I haven't done anything to this. It hasn't been transplanted or anything. So it was just seeds in the soil. And then I use like waterproof tape, like tuck tape works really well or, or duct tape. Um, and I popped this out in a snowbank in February. And then with a whole bunch of other perennial type seeds and that stratification, that exposure to cold weather um, helps them germinate. And so I got 100% germination on my asparagus, which is great. Um, I thought I'd, I did a whole bunch of jugs of asparagus because I like to gift them to community gardens and it's a perennial food crop. So it's nice to, I don't know, it's easy. A pack of seeds makes five or six jugs and I can just say, yeah, if you want asparagus, here you go. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna transplant these at some point here, but I just wanted to show what that, what it does, like what it actually, you know, throwing a milk jug full of seeds into your snowbank, snowbank it yeah. does sometimes work out. I've had good success with a bunch of um, other perennials. I've got purple coneflower, um, obedience plant, uh, a coreopsis, um, what else? That's about it. Violas, my, my pansies did great with that too. I've um, done my delphiniums in in that because if you read the instructions on the seed packet it says the plant must be stratified well stratified means that it's got to go through a cold period and that isn't your freezer <laughs> it's just a little too cold and the other thing is nowadays our freezers are frost free so there's no humidity getting into that freezer so by doing it in this moist soil and putting it yeah. in the milk jug with the top, with the cap off, yes. so any ambient moisture does get in, snow and rain do get in there. Yeah, and it just builds up. It's so funny to look, and you'll look at the cap and you'll go, oh my goodness, the snow fell right in it. Yeah, just in a little yeah. circle, but it's enough, it's moisture. enough to keep it, and I've, you know, since the summer has began, I've watered it pretty consistently, otherwise this would dry out really fast, but I haven't fertilized, I haven't done anything, I've been really lazy about this, this is my last one. So, but I just wanted to. Are you going to plant it? I planted one at mid sun. That's okay. Um, I've taken some out to Land of Dreams. This one will probably go to the Sutina Garden. So, out to the reserve. But I like to gift things that, like the gift that will keep on giving. So, and yeah. I mean, maybe everyone already has rhubarb and lovage, and, but maybe they don't have asparagus yet. So, I think as the years go on, I mean, next year it'll probably be walking onions or something. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> Once you have walking onions, they walk with you. Yes, you never. I swear that they follow away. me from the front yard to the backyard, <laughs> down from the back corner over to the. <laughs> My mom gave me some walking onion bulbs 
when I left the States and moved here. She tucked them into one of my boxes that I packed and I didn't know. And then I, you know, they, luckily they didn't search my stuff at the border. <laughs> <laughs> I said no to the live plant material and I didn't even know they were in there. And then a few years later she said, well, have you planted those onions? And I was like, what onions? And they were in a cardboard box in the basement, totally crispy and dusty and dry when I found them. Chucked them in the compost pile, figured like, oh well, and they grew. <laughs> and now those have been spread to, they ripple out. My social circle all has walking onions from my mom's garden in Michigan. Well, we gave one walking onion to Atco, the Blue Flame Kitchen Garden. Mm -hmm. and it has now walked <laughs> throughout the garden. <laughs> Mind you, it's not as bad as the horseradish. The horseradish is going to need a serious intervention. Some, har some big harvesting maybe. Yeah, on that. well, it's got to get dug because it's now taking over the potato bed. So, does everyone know what a walking onion looks like? No, uh, no, I see some. I was, I should have brought mine. So mine are just crazy this year. Normally they, so it looks like a green onion. It's like a hollow sort of un allium looking plant, um, and it just kind of comes up and it creates these sets at the top, um, which flower. Yes. And they get really big. They look like really big onion bulbs that have sprouted. And they look really funky and twangy, like Dr. And they Seuss. twirl. Yeah, and they, they <laughs> twist and turn. And they're like, they really look weird, but cool weird, right? And then they get so heavy and the stem is hollow that it's top heavy. So it bends it down to the ground. It, it folds and then it sets. It put, puts roots down wherever, like in my rock, garden right there in the raised bed next door a bird might pick one up and chuck it in the alley and it and the there. the new growth on it is better than any green onion you buy at the grocery store they have such flavor and they're great in the spring and into summer as they're growing that's the new growth you just pull them and eat them because yep. trust me when i tell you the walking onion will just keep reproducing and going yep. so i no longer Actually, I no longer buy multiplier onions anymore. I just eat the green, the walking onion, and it's very tasty for salad. And the walking onion bulb as well is very strong oh, flavor. It's oh, it's will, very. If you cry when you cut onions, you will be bawling. It is. <laughs> I find it's like a super potent shallot. That's what. They yeah, are. They're, and they're never very big. They don't really form like a big bulb. No. But they're sort of torpedo shaped. And they're torpedoing your tear <laughs> duct. <laughs> So. They, but because they're small, you don't need a lot. I mean, or because they're pungent, you don't need a you lot. You don't need them for... I used, I used one the other night in my beef and broccoli. Yeah. And I should have cut it in half. Because I really enjoy my fresh broccoli that this year is doing touch wood, touch wood, doing well. And I had it with that. And I thought I was going to die of... Oh. <laughs> so I spent half of half of my meal picking the, the bit out, but it gave it an amazing flavor, an amazing flavor. Yeah. And they're perennials, so how can you control them in the garden so they're not walking? <laughs> you would take the you would take their tops off. Yeah, you got to so, off with their head. So when they form those twangy, twisty, turny sets at the top before they really flower, you could snip them off. But be careful, because if you do put them in your compost, they'll, yeah, they'll just grow again. Um, I they're mean, not, they're not hard to control. Harvesting regularly helps as well. It kind of controls them. I, I would I made the mistake of putting some in a raised bed. It's just just put them in the alley next to your rhubarb or put them in a neglected spot. I have a space them. between my drainage swale and my fence. There you go. And that's where I try to keep them. But I always think that that onion was what the Queen of Hearts in Alice in Wonderland was doing. Off with their heads. <laughs> <laughs> she must have been a gardener. Off with their heads. <laughs> and when they walk, it's not like they're literally like... They're not, it's not like creeping bellflower, no. like a, you know, like they're, they're pretty controllable. They just tip over and that's how they walk. And then that one grows and then it tips over and then it kind of marches on. But you can keep them in a tidy clump. If you, if yeah, you if, if you're on top of it and yeah. it's, you know. And if not, they start to root, you can just kind of pull them up. And that's the ones I'll eat for green onions. When they mm -hmm. start to come up, I start just picking them and eating them as a green onion. When 
when they're tender. It's when they get hard, oh, that twisty, turny stem. I won't do that again. <laughs> they're pungent. They're very pungent. Um, I wanted to show you some of my planters. So I love the Calgary Public Library, and this is a new book. I know you were showing it so to me. So our rock garden friends um, got me turned on to this cool way of gardening called crevice gardening, which sort of mimics, um, kind of mimics the way a mountainside might shear off. And it's sort of like shale pieces that kind of like striate a little bit. I don't know if I'm describing that right. But anyway, I just picked this up from the library. It's a new book by Kent and Seth and, and Paul Spriggs. Um, Colorado. And I was Vancouver just going to say. So a little bit different. The Colorado, uh, Kenton is from Colorado, so he's used to the high dry kind of climate that we have here. The Denver and Botanic Garden. Yes. Yep. Is where I saw them. Oh yeah. my goodness. If you want to spend a couple of days in Denver and visit. So I love my succulents a lot. My outdoor ones, hens and chicks are just so easy to grow and there's all yes. kinds of sedums. Um, and this isn't necessarily a crevice garden, but it got me inspired to start actually using some of my special rocks that I, like, I collect things. I've got my deer antlers and my rocks and my things that I find. Um, so yeah, I've started reading this book and, and kind of checking in with our friends at the, at the Alpine. Crags. Yeah, crags. Yeah. And they're very encouraging. And so I've just created my own, you know, it's, I can't really justify redoing my yard again after just finishing it in the last couple of years so i'm doing all these little planters and so i've been just kind of piecing together rocks that i've found in my travels and hens and chicks they're making chicks all the time so i just pluck them off and poke them into my planters and then they create this cool sort of arrangement doesn't everyone bring rocks home for their travels <laughs> My husband wishes I didn't, but I always leave room in the car because I know I'll find some driftwood or something fun. Yeah, to yeah. In, so. I just got a new fence and it has shelves on it. Ah, more planters then. Yeah, yeah. and more rock and more pieces of stumps and yeah. Yeah, little treasures. Right? Yes, exactly, exactly. Probably it just gets like. As I'm passing by with the hose, I'll just give it up. That's it. How much do you water with a passing glance? Yeah, these <laughs> ones, I, honestly, I could probably have left them all summer and not water once and they'd be just fine. So again, another reason I'm really into the rock gardening or at least this style is that um, I don't, I, I make it and I don't have to do anything to it. Will they survive winter? Um, they will if I kind of heal this into the ground. Usually what I do is uh, I usually give these away and then when people, when they receive them, I say just take, you can just tease these out. They're really, I mean, I could just pull one out now. They're really shallow rooted and just pop them into a rock wall or a spot in your garden where you want hens and chicks to proliferate and they will. And this, I can just shove that right back in there and it's just fine. Like as long as it doesn't tumble out or a magpie doesn't, you know, grab it and play with it. That's fine. No, the squirrels. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, they're really low maintenance, um, xeriscape friendly, so really water wise, uh, really easy and they're just cute. They're just really fun to play with and they make a great gift. I'll sometimes go to the thrift store and find just cute little planters or I'm given a, you know, a plant in a pot that I, I don't need anymore and I'll just kind of make this up and give it to friends and then I feel like I'm sort of also getting rid of some of my rock collection and, and some of your hens and chicks some of my hens and chicks <laughs> and then it's nice to sort of encourage people that are maybe new to gardening how easy it can be if they don't know um, where to start or what yeah. perennials to start with I mean these guys are pretty well which sedum is this one the purple leaf that's a dragon's blood Yes. Yeah. Dragon's yeah. blood sedum grows in your garden. It can get about this tall and it's like a little bush and they're yeah. fabulous, but you can take cuttings from them and put them all through things. It's like putting a bouquet into a, into a pot. I just they're, gently pulled these off of the mother plant and tucked them in the corner and they're in sand. So 
Yeah. And then this is Creeping Jenny, which can get away from you over time, but it's really cute in a pot. So. Does it Did get? you have a question? I was just wondering if you could keep those indoors. Um, I think people want to do that, yeah. but I would say no. It's better to keep hens and chicks outside. It's just harder to well, they're, mother nature. They're know? a broadleaf evergreen. They're going to stay green all winter. Outside. So outside. Yeah. And on the outside, once they get a bit of snow cover on them, they do quite well. I have friends who do keep their pots, but they plant them into their vegetable garden and cover them with leaves. I could probably just kind of squish this down in a raised bed and mulch it and it'd be fine. I like put up maybe a little, if I'm worried about the rocks getting a bunch of debris in it, just put a little piece of burlap or yep. something over it and leave yeah. it. Um, I know folks who have much bigger planters. I think if you're looking at a planter that's like, I don't know, wash tub size or bigger, you could easily overwinter things in there. Yeah. The, the Kathy Curio from the Crags and several of the Crags members. The Rock and Alpine Garden Society mm -hmm. keep a lot of their bigger planters or a lot of their succulent collections and stuff in containers and they just mulch them really well mm -hmm. and keep them covered. Mm -hmm. I have run out of room in my house though so I'm I'm <laughs> avoiding that and yeah. my garage has gone from being a two-car garage to a one-car garage because of the plant material that lives there in the winter months. Your Japanese maple? Yeah, my Japanese maple any day now is going to have to go in a bigger pot and then it'll be a no-car garage. So, <laughs> <laughs> If you wanted to make these that would be more friendly for indoors, um, yes. I would just choose, just go to the, like Green Gate's got a yeah. huge awesome and, and golden acre. They have a great selection of indoor um, tropical succulents. Yeah, there's so Echeverium is one that looks a lot like our Sempervivum. This is Sempervivum always living. This yes. is an outdoor hens and chick, but the Echeverium is. Am I saying that right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Those are those would not live outside here, so those would be great. For I the use them in my summer plant. planters, but I bring them you in. Bring them in, yeah. And they grow from leaves quite easily, yeah. and believe it or not, the jade plant, the Crashula that will go outside and come back in and there's several varieties of the the crashula one of my favorites is the one that's called the toes and it looks like a little leaf folded over and there's a toe it's a toe <laughs> <laughs> and it's one of my favorites to try it and i give pieces of it to people and they look at it and they go it's deformed <laughs> no it's a it's the way it's supposed to grow <laughs> so I think succulents are fascinating and I think they're versatile. I, I like them from that standpoint. I also like them because with watering them, they don't need to be drowned, if you will. It's as Joanna says, she passes yeah, over them. Just barely misting them. And I will tell you, they are a gateway plant. So yes. they like, I was like, okay, I'm good with hens and chicks and I've got them tucked everywhere in all different varieties, but now, I'm looking through this book and I'm like, oh, look at these miniatures, look at these cactus. We have native cactus we can plant here, which again is like super easy. It, it's easier than the hens and chicks. And But man, I mean, I look at some of these and I'm just like, hens and chicks are going to go in the corner now while I start to seek out some of these. It's inevitable. You grow as a gardener. You, your interests expand and you learn more about different plants. So I'll be looking for my alpine dwarf varieties coming up, probably starting them from seed or connecting with, with crags more. Yes. And yeah, but yeah. But I think gardening is all about the continuation of the hobby and changing what you want to grow and how you want to grow it. Mm -hmm. I mean, how many of you have switched over from just your traditional flower bed to some food, some flowers, and maybe a collection or two of, say, hydrangeas or mm -hmm. <laughs> something roses. like that. Yeah, and roses. Oh, my goodness. It, it's just the hardest thing for me to do is to walk into a garden center and walk out empty-handed. <laughs> <laughs> I honestly I feel me. that I should have a badge this big or bigger or on my back that says, I am a plantaholic, don't sell me anything. <laughs> or I should have a sign on my back that says, my dog can't sleep in her crate anymore because I keep plants in it <laughs> and on it. So we, we do have our little choices to make in life in the plant world. I mean, really and truly.
So is there any more questions? No? Any chance? Yeah. Yes. That's what? Pinky that? Liatris. L I A T R I S. It is on my list on the Yard Smart website. The perennials, oh, it's on that list as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There you go. <laughs> there, on the Mackenzie, right there. Mackenzie oh. seed one. Liatris. Yeah. Kath mentioned it's a native. You yes. will see a smaller version of the cultivar, you know, the, the cultivar. The cultivar is a little bit narrower, but you'll see it on mountain hikes. Um, oh, yeah. And it's Waterton. Really, it's a great perennial in a landscaped garden because it's really water-wise. Just like oh, you say yes. with your Yard Smart, it's, it doesn't need a lot of attention. It's a pollinator magnet, and it's really striking. I mean, this, this flower, it's like a sort of a squirrel tail. There aren't a lot of flowers that come up and spike like that. Um, it's a bulb too. This will have flat. This will be purple from here all, all the, the way. way up. So uh -huh. it's it's yeah. really pretty. Also called uh, gay feather. Gay feather and blazing star. Blazing. The star. cultivar is blazing star. And there's white. Yes. And this color purple. And that is called. I need to be divided. The bulbs are pushing each other out. Okay. Yeah. That's. You can take it for a while. <laughs> I know, but now's the time this fall, because it's a bulb, you can get in there, lift the clump, and just start dividing. I always try to get them completely out so that I can use a fork and get between the bulbs. And then I just quarter it or half it. Yeah, but they do get really lovely and big. But that's why it's flopping, because they are a rigid stem, but they tend to flop a bit as they get crowded. I love so. them. They look really good with ornamental grasses. They're just so pretty. Yeah. They so much texture and movement to the garden. Yeah. Really pretty. My neighbors had her garden redone at the front with no lawn, and she's got grasses and liatris, nice. and it just looks really nice. It's very pretty. I had a question about them. I, I planted mine um, this spring, and I'm wondering if they're going to be taller next year or if they'll going to get to their Are they only about this tall? No, I've got one that's about 24 and 28. That's about. That's, that's about the average size. Yeah, that's. They're lost with everything else around them. Mm -hmm. Yes. I yeah. Really plant thick and they're yeah. Yeah. They, forward if you can. Yeah, pull them out a bit and they should be. They get about, they get about that tall. Yeah. 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 And that's kind of where they max out. Yeah. They really are quite interesting from that standpoint. Sure. I bring samples here. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> Mind your purse. My, um, this is my fuchsia, and it's been fine, but it's starting to get that kind of a mark on the leaves there. Mildewy? No, it's not mildew, I don't think. It's browning, like brown spots on it. Your fuchsias you? are by the front posts, the east facing? They are usually underneath the eave there is where okay. I've put them. Shady I moved them. them. Yeah, I did move them, hang, hung, hung them on the tree out front, and oh, they nice. are getting a little bit more sun, so oh, okay. I'm wondering if that's I wonder if there's sunburn the spots. problem with them. No, they have spider mite. Oh, oh is it spider, spider mite? <laughs> oh, when you get your... Oh, okay. Can you see the white the dusting? Yeah. See the little dots? I'm not seeing it. Now, see? Sorry. Oh, sorry. Can you see it? Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Right. Those they are spots. Yeah, and, and the giveaway... The when they were turning brown, I thought it was. Yeah, but, no, but when you look closely and you start to see this striation of color yeah. and this change in here, okay, and it actually the brown becomes more orange. Yeah, yeah and that's really what there's brown. there's one here that's quite see it's starting yes. to do the orange. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I've been picking the leaves off, but it's getting worse, and I wondered uh. if I, I wondered if they were getting a little bit too much sun. But well, no, this mite, is no. this is spider mite. Okay, I get my sprayer. I was just going to say, There's yeah. There's a favorite tool, too, the magnifying glass. Yeah. Yes, I see. Which I, I could see. Yeah. yeah. They're little. Uh, yeah, there's an, a, there's an adult. I can see it now. Yeah, see yeah. the adult totally there? Right away. Yeah. 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 Okay. Emily, can you show this to everybody, please? Thank just you for here. bringing samples. <laughs> yeah. Oh, very helpful. <laughs> if you show them with the magnifying yeah. glass with the orange side to the top, and then if they can just see the whites, do you see it? Don't okay, good. Just, <laughs> just show everybody so they can see what they're looking for. Spider mite is one of those pest issues that looks a whole lot like 
other things at first. Yeah. Until it's too late and then you know for sure you have spider mite. <laughs> yeah. And then it's hard to get rid of because so just spray the whole spray the whole plant <laughs> underneath side of the leaves. Yeah, go it. under especially if is it hanging up, I would spray under it. Yeah, I'd stand it is. I moved it, yeah, but some of them are yeah. I yeah. Can, I can hang them. Yeah. yeah. Just and just stay it's very hot and very dry. Like I know how dry it is right now. Yeah. And I'm looking at the fact that we're going to see a lot of these insects that only occur when we're very dry. And that's, that's kind of what... Well, I, some people use soap. I'm not a big fan of the soap in the hot weather because it causes dam more damage to the leaves than the actual insecticide. But there is a mite killer spray. There is also a product called Ambush. And Ambush is very effective on spider mite. So go to the, safers, like, the, the soap. Is that three in one or oh, the three in one safers. Yes, I like that one. Now, how careful do you have to be about it getting on your skin? And that? I'm very careful. Personally, remember the biggest absorption points of any kind of toxin, anything, are the palms of your hands and the soles of your feet. So I always say when you're going to spray. Yeah, and this. So um, I always, always have, sometimes, <laughs> I have safety goggles. Um, you will find that the safers will pot your sunglasses. So, but use safety goggles. Try to do it like on a non wind obviously non windy day. Does it matter if it's in the morning? It's prefer the non-windy times, like early morning or late in the day. But when you're buying sunglasses, these are dirty. <laughs> Make sure they have sides to them so that you don't get them. This right here is the most easily damaged part of your face. However, saying that, I have what they call malathion burn from malathion, which was used forever. I have malathion burn on this part of my nose. And it, I didn't realize what I had done, but I climbed up into the rafters to walk, to spray the hanging plants 40 years ago. <laughs> and I still have a, a still remark. And I can remember going to my doctor and he yeah. gave me that lecture. So be careful. So, you have to worry about long sleeves? I would, I, I don't do anything now without long sleeves and long. Put stuff on. Yeah, and then wash it, put it in the hamper, and, and then make sure you've got some of that clothing that you designate that you're going to go out in the garden in. I have a beat up pair of running shoes that I do my spraying in and that sort of thing. And with the Safers 3-in-1, in about 36 hours after you've applied it, wash it off. So, yeah, so you just spray it down with a light spray on your hose, and that washes the soap, soapy part of the three in one off. Now so, I used it on now, did my, I got little um, dahlias, like dahlias at the store because they were on yeah. dead sale. But anyway, they have, they have gone through three cycles now of powdery mildew on it, and uh -huh. I spray it, and then the leaves go black after I've sprayed it. Is that typical? That's what typical what the powdery mildew spray is meant to do. Okay. It's to rob the plant of the active chlorophyll that the powdery mildew attaches itself to. So by it going black, it's eliminating the chlorophyll that is actively producing the powdery mildew. So it will only turn leaves black that have the mildew. That's right. Is yeah. That and then the, yeah, the rest of the plant should be healthy. And to encourage the health of the plant, pinch some of the flower buds off so that the plant will have a chance to give itself some more energy and work backwards. It's like any of the tubers or bulbs, when they're in flower, they're a little bit weaker, so they're not as strong. It's just like zucchini and cucumber, etc. get powdery mildew once they start to produce fruit and flowers because their leaves become weaker and the chlorophyll doesn't defend them very well. So that is the biggest reason for it. But pruning the flowers out helps to give them more energy. It was, it was, it was not a good
good sale. It was not a good find. Sale, but You've spent good more sale. money on powdery mildew than you have on the. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think so. Even though yeah. they were cheap, they're not. Yeah. Yeah, so I, and I get the problems. Yeah. They come with it, and you don't see it right away when you're buying the plant. At the garden center, I would never. Some of the staff would rescue things out of sick bay. I didn't want to bring home more than I could, you know, and I, yeah, I always coveted that euphorbia, but I don't want the mealybug. So sometimes you've got to be very aware of what you're rescuing or seeing and, and stay on top of it. Have any, are any of you growing tomatoes? Yep. Okay. This weather has brought out leaf curl in your tomatoes. Now there's two kinds of leaf curl. This particular one, <laughs> this leaf, the hail got it in the early part of the season. So you can see where the hail took it. And then it is suffering terribly from my extreme neglect of not fertilizing enough. And it happens with fertilizer and lack of nutrients. It'll happen from the bottom of the plant up. And that's what this cupping is. Now there is also, and it's been quite a problem in Calgary in the last three or four years, I keep hearing about it, and it's a tomato virus, leaf curl virus. But when it does that, the leaves go gray and they go really, really tight. I, I, I don't have it. I, I kind of looked at this and went, oh my gosh, and I was checking the top of my plant to make sure I didn't have leaf curl virus. But watch carefully at this time of year for things like your tomatoes and your cucumbers, your beets. Watch the leaves carefully because it'll usually tell you it wants to fertilize. It wants to be fertilized. Cupping up usually means nutrient deficiency. Cupping down is usually a sign of water deprivation and it will literally start to droop down. Tomatoes droop down anyway in the severe heat. They'll, they'll cling to their branches because they reverse their photosynthetic process in the heat. And they'll, tra they'll hold their moisture or until night and then in the middle of the night they go into reverse osmosis and they release their oxygen then. So it, it's a lot different than what we think it is. Most of the time we're not looking at a virus. But I mean in the industry, we call green ash trees chicken trees. They're the last ones to leaf out and the first ones to lose their leaves. But they're extremely valuable um, protectors of our light, etc. But they're really valuable in dry climates because they will collapse their leaves just like the tomato does and absorb moisture. And, and keep moisture within themselves and reverse their osmosis. So the boulevard trees in Calgary that are... Can I pass this around? Sure, yes, please. There's... So, oh. Yes. So if, if we have that, what do they send? You want to make sure that you're feeding it, fertilizing it. And I, this is where at this time of year I'm very actively using my compost tea or fish fertilizer, either one of them that helps it. And when you're watering, make sure that you water till the water runs out. But don't water every day. Water about every two or three days. Water deep. Like, let the water penetrate and go deep. It's why I tell people to plant your, your tomato plants with pots that have holes on the side, not just on the bottom. And that way you get more moisture. You get more aware of how well the water's... And, they absorb on the outer root rather than the inner root. So water the edge of the pot. And that really helps them to absorb more. But I mean, and it's the same thing. One of the reasons a lot of the cities have gone to using green ash is because of their water wise. They're very, very valuable in a drought. So if emerald ash borer does not become a thing. Yeah, well, let's hope not. <laughs> yeah, I was just in the Midwest and there's yeah. pretty much no ash trees left. Oh, um, yeah. So um, that's why we um, don't prune. With the tomato virus, I have seen that in community gardens, and I wonder, it's just on particular plants, what do you do? Like, when you, is that plant toast and you need to destroy it? Destroy it. You so don't keep it. Because if you keep it there, it spreads. Yes. You're not going to get healthy fruit anyway. And it's varietal. 
Okay. There's certain varieties of tomatoes that get the tomato curl virus. And it's some of the, there, there's two kinds, of three actually, two kinds that I know for sure don't get it. I, I've never seen it touch wood. I've never seen it on determinant tomatoes. Determinant tomatoes are the ones that produce one crop. They flower at the same time, they produce all one crop of tomatoes and then they're done. Indeterminate are the ones that will flower variously throughout the season and produce tomatoes continuously. And then there's semi-determinant. Now, there's only about five varieties of that and you have to watch those ones a little bit. I really, there's a guy in Airdrie, Casey's. I don't know if you've met Casey and his tomatoes. But anyway, he grows one called Stupus. And it makes the best soup, the best tomato juice, and it's semi-determinant. But you have to watch it because of the moisture levels. If you miswater it, it doesn't like it, and it will go on strike. And then it develops the deficiency that causes the leaf virus. However, some of the older varieties, the strong ones, are way stronger than some of the newer varieties, and they don't get the leaf curl. So I, I just sort of watch what varieties. I like Sweet 100, the, the small cherry tomatoes. I love Sun Gold. Its parentage is very ancient. So you just gradually, but the growers are gradually eliminating the varieties that get the virus. So, but you know, it's just a question of being vigilant. And this is a time of year, this is a time of our season where we see a lot more of that because it's been, plants have been stressed through the heat and the dryness. So. Like you said, we'll see those bugs that like that, those conditions start to really go crazy. And Cabbage white moths. Yeah. I was going to bring my <laughs> tennis racket as another tool to share, but I decided not. She sits and hits them. <laughs> I haven't this summer at all, but I also planted less brassicas. I just, I stuck with kohlrabi mostly because I don't care what they do to the leaves. The no, is forming and it's fine. Well, my kohlrabi is forming too, so I'm yeah. not worried. I didn't cover it, but I covered my broccoli because I want broccoli, and my broccoli's been stupendous again this year. Floating row cover is probably the best. Yeah, the is, white fabric. Yeah. yeah, just putting that over it makes the big difference because that little white moth comes flying in and he lays his eggs there, and then you get the little. And it doesn't take. The thing that gets me is that little white moth comes out and it hatches and it comes out and it starts laying eggs and within 10 days you got those little green <clears throat> curse word curse word curse word <laughs> coming out in your leaves of your broccoli your cabbage etc and the brassica family are vast and that they are only interested in them this year i planted a hedge of dill because it has that flat flower and I, maybe that's why I'm not getting as much. However, I covered, as soon as I started to see the white ones getting really thick, I went out and covered them. Yeah. So you kind of have to do it right from the start. Yeah. Otherwise they, and make sure your floating roll cover is anchored because they get under there and then nothing worse than seeing one under the floating roll cover. Yes. Just completely protected. <laughs> But yeah, having the life of Riley because he's in there going, ah, which one shall I eat today? So I see those <laughs> butterflies. I've stopped swatting them out of the sky with my tennis, my old beaten up tennis racket because... She really does first that. First of all, well, I learned that from my mom. So my mom was a, she's probably, my mom and my grandma are the reasons I love gardening so much. But my mom would give me a nickel a caterpillar which is pretty good money for a young kid um from the cabbage loopers and she would put them in an old blender with like whatever her juju sauce was like garlic and cayenne pepper and an egg yolk and whatever she did and then she claims she would spray that back onto her brassica plants and it would keep the cabbage loopers off but i felt like i was continuously making money so I don't know how well her plan worked <laughs> and I'd go and spend it on candy and stuff so I don't know anyway but then and she, we'd always have like a tennis racket or a badminton racket around and she would say oh we'll swap those white butterflies out of the air I've stopped because <laughs> one I my kids started picking up on that and I was like okay this is like violent gardening this could go really wrong if they miss gives a whole new meaning to gorilla gardening <laughs> right also um those 
butterflies do pollinate other things. I see them yes, all they over do. my raspberry flowers. They're all over my perennials. And I just think if you can't beat them, join them and just try and be smarter than this tiny little white butterfly. <laughs> and just be ahead of the game. So instead of trying to kill them and be reactive, I just try to keep them out. Keep them out. That's yeah. that's my or thing. plant things that they don't, you know, I stopped growing cabbage because... If I want to well, mine, cabbage, I had half a cabbage. Yeah, and they just get into the cabbage and it's annoying. And I think, I mean, I low real estate space in my garden anyway, so I'll just go buy cabbage from someone who grows really nice cabbage. But I can grow things that they don't really bother too much, like the kohlrabi or the kale, the dinosaur kale. They don't seem to bother too much, so I stick with those. They That's the wrinkly, wrinkly like, one. Yeah. Yeah. The one that looks the kale. like elephant skin. Yeah, it looks all... It's <laughs> quite tasty, though. It's really good. It keeps well, and it's great cooked or raw, so, yeah. Yeah. Well, well, another question. Um, the leaf petunias, leaf petunias, the dead, the dead flowers on them. They're supposed to be self-cleaning, but all the dead flowers are on it, so... Uh, does it matter if I pitch them like a regular petunia or can I just pick them off? No, you've got to pinch them like even a regular Even on a wave. Because a wave will maintain... Do you want me to bring that closer? No, I think I can reach. That's what I've been doing, but I thought maybe there's a need. Maybe I'm wasting my time. No, no. <laughs> the wave petunia, when it's starting to do produce a seed as well, it's the heat that's doing that. And, that, and the extra sunshine. So if you don't take that seed head out, it's going to just go to seed and finish itself. So, yeah. So you have to deadhead. 